Hello everyone and welcome to this talk uh, in FOSDEM in the Embedded and Automotive track. Uh, I'm Maxime and today I'm going to talk about network performances, uh, a topic that was previously more in the realm of servers but nowadays with the modern uh, hardware we are starting to get more advanced uh, networking components inside embedded systems. So uh, I thought it was relevant to discuss uh, all of these features and advanced techniques in the embedded track. So uh, let me first introduce myself. I'm Maxim. Uh, I've been working at Bootlin for three years and uh, most of my work has been dedicated to uh, implementing uh, new features for drivers uh, for Marvel platforms uh, in the networking uh, domain. So I've been working with, with the PPV2 and MVNeta drivers, but also Phi drivers and switch drivers. And more recently, I've been also involved a bit in the media topics. So what we're going to cover in this talk basically is um, seeing what happens when you are receiving packets on your system, uh, but diving into the advanced te techniques that we can use to make this packet processing uh, a bit faster on new systems. So we're going to follow first the packet uh, through the hardware and then through the software. Uh, we are going to, to dive into the, the modern network interface controllers uh, and see what features are present in, in modern hardware and see how the kernel handles all of these features. So, and finally, we're going to talk a lot about uh, offloading. So basically making the hardware do the heavy lifting for us. So uh, first let's follow the path of a packet through the hardware and then through the software. So the hardware is pretty simple. So what you usually have uh, is first a link partner. The link partner is basically the, the, the thing, the device you are plugged to. So that, that is at the other side of your link. Uh, so it can be a switch if you are talking about layer 2, but it can also be uh, a remote server uh, and so on. Um, deep into the, the, the details of the, the, the physical aspects, we have the connector. Uh, so the connector is a bit important because you might be familiar with the standard um, RJ45 connector, uh, which is also called AP8C. Uh, but we also find a lot of SFP cages uh, on, on uh, fast equipment and so these kind of SFP connectors uh, sometimes embed a PHY uh, which can also impact some performances depending on what you have inside your connector. Um, in between the devices you have what we call the media, so it can be um, electrical wires made in copper or it can be an optical fiber, it can be a radio signal. Uh, we are going to focus mostly on Ethernet technologies right now, so we are going to focus on uh, copper and fiber. And inside your own hardware you are going to find a, a PHY, so the PHY is the component that is going to handle all of the physical aspects of your link. So basically uh, decoding the electrical signal that comes into your device and transforming that into something that uh, your CPU uh, can understand. So um, you have to, to realize that there are lots and lots of available technologies out there uh, that you can use uh, at the physical level, uh, such as fiber technologies, copper technologies, uh, and Basically, all of the modern SOCs only understand a few protocols at the MAC level. Uh, so the PHY is in charge of converting uh, these media-dependent signals into something that is more standard. It is also in charge of handling things like uh, collisions on the wire and negotiating the speed of your link. Um, then we have the NIC. So what we call a NIC is a network interface controller. So it's it basically your networking hardware. Uh, so uh, sometimes the NIC includes a PHY. So you can think of a PCI networking card that, that you put on your in your desktop uh, in your desktop computer. Uh, but in our case, in embedded systems, most of the time you have the PHY that is a separated component, and the NIC is inside your system on the chip and it's basically just a, a Mac uh, with also some extra features to offload uh, some things that we're going to see a bit later. Uh, the Mac being the component that handles the layer 2 protocol, so that is a part of the Ethernet standard, 
and that is going to transfer the data from the file into the, the memory, uh, so the RAM of your system, so that the CPU can then process that. It also works, of course, in reverse, um, transferring the data from your memory uh, to uh, the external world in the transmit path. So uh, uh, this is a, a small schematic of what happens when you are receiving what we call a frame, so uh, which is a, a, a unit of data at the Ethernet level. Uh, so you are going to receive your data. The Mac is going to, to receive that data from your file. And it is going to write it directly into RAM uh, using DMA, so direct memory access. Um, once the transfer is done, the Mac is going to create what we call a, a descriptor, which is a small piece of information that resides also in RAM and that is going to contain information about uh, the address of the buffer, for example. And then uh, the address of the descriptor itself is going to be put inside a queue inside the Mac. So the main goal of the queue is that uh, you can receive some data while you are processing them in the CPU. So if you are receiving a lots and lots of data at uh, any given time, uh, having a queue allows you to, to be able to process that data uh, with a bit of latency. Uh, so, uh, once the, the Mac is done receiving the data and it has written everything into a buffer, uh, it is going to, to raise an interrupt to the CPU so that the CPU is going to handle the, the data. So, um, one important thing is that uh, you only have one CPU core that is going to handle the interrupt. And uh, it's important to, to realize that this CPU core that is going to handle the interrupt is also going to do most of the processing of your packet in the kernel side. So it's pretty important to, uh, to know which CPU is going to handle the interrupt. Uh, so once the interrupt has been, uh, has been written, uh, the, the CPU is going to uh, start reading the buffer and, uh, and delegate all the processing to the kernel code. In the meantime, the Mac can be receiving other packets, other frames, and it's going to put it in other buffers in RAM and put uh, addresses uh, of these new buffers into the queue. The packet, in the meantime, uh, is going to be processed in what we call soft IRQ context. So uh, we are not going to run all of the packet processing from within hardware interrupt context because um, when we are in a hardware interrupt handler, uh, bas it basically means that you cannot receive other interrupts in the meantime. And so uh, if you are going to process your packet in hard interrupt context, you are going to introduce a lot of latency for the other processes on your system. So um, the, 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 at this point, uh, the interrupt handler is uh, implemented in the driver for your NIC. So uh, from now on, the CPU is going to be in charge of, uh, of the, the, the packets and of the data. So the hardware interrupt handler is going to do very basic work, uh, almost nothing. What it does is that it will mask the interrupt so that we cannot receive any further interrupt for incoming packets. And it is then going to uh, call what we call the NAPI loop. So NAPI is a software uh, mechanism implemented in the kernel that is going to um, process the incoming frames in batches. So the, the main point is that instead of having one interrupt per incoming frame, uh, what we are going to do is that when we receive the first frame, we usually expect to receive more uh, right after it. Okay, so most of the, the network usage and use cases is done uh, with bursts of packets being received. For example, when you load an, a web page, uh, most of the time you are going to have a lot of network traffic at once. When you are loading the page, you download the, the, the HTML code, you download the images and so on, and then you pretty much don't use the network anymore. Uh, so having this kind of burst processing is very useful because you only have one interrupt that is coming, then you mask it, and then you do a buzzy polling loop uh, with N NAPI. So NAPI is going to uh, dequeue the subsequent frames and stop uh, either when there are not any frame coming anymore, or uh, when you have what we call a budget that is expired. So basically when you process, let's say, uh, 50 packets in a row, uh, you are going to stop the loop uh, so that other processes can use the CPU uh, in their turn. 
Uh, at the, the end of the, the nappy loop, uh, what we do is we re-enable interrupts so that we can start again receiving packets uh, and that we can be notified of the next packet that is coming in. So, uh, after that point, uh, it's up to the, to the kernel to, uh, to run the, the packet processing. So, uh, the kernel is going to call a lot of hooks internally. So, first it's going to call the pcap hook. hook. So, basically it means that uh, right after you receive the packet, uh, you make it available for tools such as TCP dump or Wireshark. Then there are lots of hooks such as TC that are called uh, so that you can do some uh, traffic policing, for example, or rate limitation. And after that, the kernel is going to uh, unpack all of the headers inside your, your packet. So uh, first it is going to unpack the IP header, IPv4 or V6. Um, it is going to decide if you need to forward the packet, if you are um, routing packets, uh, if you need to drop the packet, or if you need to pass the packet to uh, the, the, the next layer. Then the layer 4 is going to be unpacked, so um, TCP or UDP or whatever protocol is there. Uh, and then you are going to decide if you need to pass this packet to user space. Um, so you are going to, to perform a lookup based on the IP and um, ports that are present in your packet to decide uh, which socket is going to process the packet. Um, so the kernel data pass is very complex. Uh, lots of protocols are supported. Uh, it's been there for a while and it is heavily optimized for lots of, uh, of use cases. However, uh, processing and unpacking the various headers uh, still requires some processing power, especially when you are uh, running very, very high speed network connections at 10 gigabits per second or 40 gigabits per second or higher. Uh, in that case, the CPU can start being the, the bottleneck. So um, we're going to see some, some techniques that we can use to uh, do what we call spreading and steering of the traffic. So. On, on modern systems and even modern embedded systems, most of the time you have several CP CPU cores available. Uh, on the latest Raspberry Pi, you have, I don't know, four cores maybe. And even on, on very small budget system on chips, you have, uh, it, it's not uncommon to have multiple CPU cores. Uh, the same goes from, uh, for network uh, controllers. So most of the time you don't have a single receive and transmit queue you have multiple queues available inside uh, your NIC. And so, uh, if you remember what I said earlier, uh, only the CPU that was handling the interrupt is going to do the packet processing. So, if all of the interrupts go to the CPU core uh, zero, but you have four cores available, well, the core zero is going to do all of the processing, at least in the kernel side, uh, and all of the other CPUs are not going to help at all. So what we want is techniques to help uh, scaling the traffic handling inside the kernel uh, across all of the CPUs. So um, scaling, is, it's not that straightforward. Uh, you cannot simply uh, randomly assign an incoming packet to a CPU. You cannot say, I have one packet that is incoming, CPU number three isn't doing anything, I am going to schedule that packet processing on CPU number three. And by packet processing, I mean uh, all of the process of running the PCAP hook and unpacking the IP header and TCP header and so on. So doing that processing on random cores, it will work, but it will not be optimis uh, optimized and you might not gain that much performances. Uh, one of the problems is that you have to preserve the ordering of the incoming packets. And if you start randomly assign uh, CPUs uh, to packets, uh, you don't really know in which order all of the cores are going to process the packets. And also, if you start doing that, um, most likely you, you have streams that are coming in. So let's say uh, you are watching a, a stream, streaming video. Um, if all of the, the data is coming to random CPUs inside your stream, um, the cache usage is not going to be uh, very optimized. Uh, you are going to enqueue data from CPU 0 and then CPU 3, CPU 2 and CPU 0 again. And so you don't make a very optimized use of your caching inside your hardware. So 
what we use inside the kernel is uh, spreading uh, using flows. So uh, a good documentation on that is in the networking slash uh, scaling file uh, inside the kernel doc that is going to also explain what I'm going to present uh, right now, uh, but with a bit more technical details. Uh, so, sorry. Uh, so uh, what uh, uh, what a flow is basically is uh, a collection of packets that are uh, distinct to the to the same consumer and that are emitted by the same emitter. So, uh, for example, when you are watching a video stream all of the packets inside that stream are part of the same flow. Uh, they are emitted by the same server somewhere and they are consumed by the same process in user space. Um, whereas uh, when you are watching a video stream and browsing your emails uh, in, in another uh, window, the emails that you are going to receive are part of another flow because uh, they are not emitted by the same server and they are not going to go uh, to the same process in user space. So the, the flows are also at different levels, uh, depending on the, the granularity of information you are going to look uh, at. For example, if you are uh, implementing software for a networking router, uh, you don't really care about the target, uh, the target process. You don't care about the, the layer 4 information, the, the, the ports and so on. Uh, you are only going to look at the IP fields, so the source address and destination address to take your decision about routing this packet to an interface or another. So in that case, you are going to use what we call two-tuple flows, which only take into account the source and destination IP address. On the other hand, uh, if you are going to, to care about uh, the destination port, for example, uh, most likely you are going to use what we call five-tuple uh, flows, so we are going to look at five different information from within the headers. So the source and destination IP address, the source and destination ports, and also the protocols that, he, that, he, that is being used at the layer 4. So whether you are using UDP or TCP, for example. So uh, other flows can be interesting too. So for example, you can, uh, you can base, uh, base your flows on the VLAN tag. So maybe you are going to perform some actions depending on the VLAN tag of your packet or also on the destination MAC address of your packet. Uh, most of the time, what we do internally, uh, whether we are talking about uh, hardware flow management or software flow management, is that we're going to extract all of these, uh, these fields, these tuples from your, your, the header and hash that uh, so that we have a smaller piece of data to work with. And also we are going to modulo that information with the number of flows we want to support. Okay, so this can be a number like uh, 4096. Yes, but more advan advanced NICs for the, the server world are able to keep track of a very, very high number of flows. So uh, with that in mind, uh, uh, what we are going to do to spread the traffic across the CPUs is basically spread the flow processing uh, across the CPU. So identify the flow uh, for which this packet is part and uh, decide uh, what CPU is going to handle that flow. Uh, and with that in mind, we are sure that every CPU is going to handle packets from the same flows. Uh, the first technique that we use to do that is called RPS, so standing for Receive Packet Steering. Um, RPS is a purely software implementation um, of uh, spreading uh, based on flows. So the interrupted CPU, so in our case it's core 0, so core 0 in our case is going to receive all of the interrupts uh, from the, the Mac. And what it is going to do is extract the, the data, so the 2-tuple or 5-tuple data from the header, perform the hashing, and then based on the hash it is going to select uh, another CPU card to process the packet. So that way we, we still have a bit of software processing to do. Core 0 still has to handle all of the interrupt, but the, pro the, the processing of the packet is going to be performed by other CPUs. So um, this technique is very easy to use. Uh, the first thing you need to have is a kernel built with config RPS. 
this is the default configuration for multi-core uh, kernels. So it's basically always enabled when you have a, a kernel built for an SMP system. Um, and what you need to, to configure then is the set of CPUs that you, you wish to use for RPS. Maybe you want to dedicate some CPU cores to uh, other kind of processing and you don't want to spread the traffic across all of the CPUs of your system. And you can do that based uh, on the queues on your system. So if your NIC is configured to um, already spread the traffic across two receive queues, uh, you can select the CPUs on a per queue basis. But it's very common to see that used on system with only one receive queue available. So uh, this configuration is done uh, using the CFS, and in this example, we are going to spread traffic that is co coming on the RX queue number zero to CPU zero and one, and then traffic uh, for R RX queue one to CPUs two and three. So yeah, it's a very useful technique that you can use on pretty much any system uh, that has multiple CPU cores. You don't have to to have any particular feature implemented inside your NIC. Uh, what we have then in a more advanced fashion is what we call RSS. So RSS is basically an, a floated version of RPS. So uh, the, all of the process of spreading the packets across the CPUs isn't going to be done by the CPU, but it is going to be done directly uh, by your NIC. So the, the NIC is going to fire the interrupt uh, on the correct CPU core and the NIC is going to compute the hash itself, extract the flow information itself, and inside the NIC you are going to configure what we call an indirection table. So this, this is a big table that is going to contain the data uh, that is going to associate the hash to the queue that you are going to use, and the queue is going to be associated to the CPU cores. So that way the interrupt directly comes to the correct CPU, and you don't have to, to have a, a core dedicated to performing the spreading. So the indirection tables uh, are also called RSS tables. So it's a, a, a table that is contained within the NIC. And usually these tables are pretty huge. So um, you have usually much more entries in the table uh, than you have queues. So in this example, I've extracted that from a system that has uh, 128 uh, RSS table uh, with only uh, four queues available. And what this allows us to do is basically assign weight to each queue. So in the given example, what you can see is that um, you have 32 values here. Uh, and in these 32 values, uh, 16 of the values are zeros. So it basically means that uh, half uh, of the incoming packets are going to be assigned to CPU zero. And then you also have eight ones, so uh, a fourth of the packets are going to, to be uh, affected to uh, CPU number one, and then CPU number uh, two and three are going to, to get only uh, one eighth of the incoming packets. So uh, the RSS tables allows us to, to, to change the weight of each, uh, each CPU and each flow. So we don't put in actually directly the CPU number, we put the RXQ number and then from within the NIC driver we assign each RXQ to each CPU. Uh, so how do you use RSS? So uh, the first thing you need to, to do is enable the, the RSS feature uh, inside your, your NIC. Uh, you do that using uh, East tool and you need to know that not all of the NICs can implement such features. So. Um, on my laptop, for example, my, my NIC doesn't implement RSS. However, uh, on the Macchiato bin, which is a board based on, on the, the Marvel uh, SOC uh, using PPV2, uh, we have RSS available. And so you can use such a feature. So the, you can also configure the indirection table from uh, user space uh, with is tool dash X. Uh, so in my example, uh, uh, I assigned the weights such as the CPU 0 has a weight of 1, uh, CPUs 1 and 2 uh, have a weight of 2, and CPU 3 has a weight of 1. So it's basically a, a, a way to say, I want my CPUs 1 and 2 to receive twice as much traffic uh, compared to CPU 0 and 3. You can of course dump that indirection table, 
And you can also select uh, what fields you want to be extracted from the header in order to compute the hash. So basically choosing if you want to use two tuple or five tuple or if you want to use any other um, hashing method. So if you want to hash based on the, the VLAN and so on. So uh, uh, on, on the Mac yet, I've been implementing RSS uh, allowed us to, to multiply by three uh, the speed uh, in IP forwarding. So basically we were able to, to, uh, to, to perform IP forwarding at uh, the, the link speed, so at 10 gigabits per second. Uh, so, RPS and RSS are very useful uh, when a lot of the processing is done inside the kernel, but uh, they, they don't really care about who is going to consume the flow. So, it's only going to look at the header, decide which CPU is going to handle that, and that's it. But what if uh, you are going to send the flow uh, with RPS or RSS to CPU number one? But the user space process that is going to consume this packet is currently uh, being executed on CPU number two. Then you, have, you are going to have a lot of cache misses and so on. And so the performance are not optimal. So we have a technique called RFS, uh, so standing for Receive Flow Steering. And you know, all of these, uh, all of these acronyms are very uh, look-alike and it's difficult to, to, to remember which one does what. But yeah, RFS, is going basically to track uh, who is going to consume each flow and try to steer uh, each flow to the correct CPU. So RFS is a, a software implementation, it's, it's not offloaded, and, and the kernel for each flow is going to keep an internal table associating uh, the, the CPU on which the consumer lives uh, to each flow. So an example, if if you have, let's say, an HTTP uh, server running on your system, um, the, the Linux scheduler decided that uh, it's best to execute that server on CPU zero. What RFS is going to do, it's going to detect that the socket that is going to consume TCP data uh, that is um, destined to port 80 uh, is living on CPU zero. So it's being dequeued by a process on CPU zero. And so RFS is going to make so that the packet processing for this flow is going to happen on CPU zero. So a bit later on, you have other things that are running on your server and the scheduler decides, okay, so now it might be a better idea to run the HTTP daemon on CPU number one. And now uh, uh, RFS is going to update actually the, the internal table and make so that the processing for the HTTP flow is going to be done, to be done on CPU number one. Um, there are lots of mechanisms to make sure that we don't lose any packet and that the migration uh, happens correctly uh, regarding the packets that have not been enqueued yet uh, at migration time. Uh, but it, it's, it's a very good performance um, improvement mechanism and it's pretty easy to use. You don't need uh, any offloading to do that. Uh, so internally, uh, the kernel is going to keep a flow table. So this table is going to take a bit of space in memory. Um, but you as a user decide the size of this flow table. So basically how many flows do you want to track at most? Uh, there are some recommendations that are done in the, in the kernel documentation uh, for values for the number of flows you want to use. And simply writing the number of flows you want in the table is going to enable RFS. Um, so next, uh, RFS is good, but it's also a purely software implementation. Uh, what we have available is what we call accelerated RFS. And so in that case, um, it's very similar to RPS and RSS. Uh, what we have is that the NIC is going itself to uh, do the flow steering and make sure that we uh, are going to steer the, the flow to the correct CPU. So it's a, a, a work that is going to happen at both the software and the hardware level. Uh, so it's going to work just as RFS, but when you need to update the rule, uh, instead of updating the flow table that lives in the kernel, uh, the kernel is going to ask the NIC to, uh, to, to, to redirect the flow so that the interrupt fires on the correct CPU. So you need a very advanced NIC that is going to be able to extract data from the header 
and choose the receive queue according to header data. And with that, uh, you, you, are, you are going to have a, a very fast um, flow processing uh, for, 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 for each flow. Uh, so it's for now reserved for very advanced NICs. Uh, but on systems like uh, PPV2, uh, you can start um, imagining doing such a process. Um, so the way the, the, the rule is built, so whether you use 5-tuple or 2-tuple, uh, it's pretty much up to the, the, the driver to decide. So uh, you don't have much configuration to do to use uh, ARFS. Uh, you need to have a kernel built with the, the correct option. And then you need to enable what we call n-tuple filtering offloading. So making sure that the, yeah, the n-tuple extraction and steering is done directly by the hardware and not by the kernel. And then uh, if the driver supports it, uh, ARFS is going to be used. Uh, but instead of using uh, automatic mechanism, what you might want to do also is manually steer flows. So you might want to say, OK, I want to ping uh, my uh, HTTP daemon to CPU number one and manually say to my uh, controller I want to steer all of the HTTP traffic to CPU number one and that way you don't you don't have to use such automatic mechanism uh, so you have two interfaces to do that uh, which are uh, TC so uh, TC is a tool uh, for traffic control it's used um, among other things to do some traffic prioritization and bandwidth limitation. And you can also use E2, which is the tool that you use to, um, to communicate with your NIC controller and configure it. Uh, so um, these two representations with E2 and TC uh, exist in, in, they coexist in the kernel environment. And you can pretty much use these two things to do the same, uh, the same operation, which is steering per flow. Uh, but for now, you have to know that uh, while the two interfaces are currently being merged, uh, the, the two methods can conflict with each other. So if you start implementing flow steering on your system uh, with if tool or TC, just make sure to always use the same tool uh, to do the flow steering. So um, the, the flow steering ba is based on what we call steering rules. So a rule is basically a way to associate a flow type. So for example, TCP over IPv6 or UDP uh, over IPv4 and so on to a filter. So uh, let's say uh, the, the destination IP or the destination port and to actions. So uh, the action can be uh, steer that flow to uh, a given RX queue or drop that flow. So this can be used to do some early dropping or firewalling. So this is also interesting. And with a priority. So uh, an example can be, uh, I want to steer all my TCP over IPv4 traffic that is destined to the IP address. And you put the IP address of your system. Uh, destined for port 80 to uh, the RXQ number, number 2. And so you are going basically to steer all of the incoming HTTP traffic uh, for your own system uh, to RXQ number 2. Uh, and the, the prioritization is also interesting. So uh, the, in, in the first example with ETH2, um, the, the second command is going to show you how to steer, for example, UDP traffic over IPv4 uh, that is destined to port number 1234 to RXQ number 2. And the second rule is going to be drop all of the UDP traffic. And since the second rule has a, a, a lower priority compared to the first one, you are basically going to drop uh, all of the UDP traffic except uh, the one destined for port 1234. So uh, this is a very powerful way to do some filtering directly from within your hardware. So when you drop a flow, you won't even have any interrupt coming uh, to your CPU. So your CPU won't even know you have dropped some packets. So this can be a bit dangerous if you want to debug some things, but it's also a good protection uh, against, uh, against uh, denial of service. And I also included some example on how to do that with TC Flower. So TC Flower is the filter that we use to do some flow steering with TC. 
uh, TC Flower is great because if it is not able to offload the rule to the hardware, because you can express very complex rules with TC Flower, and not all of the hardware is going to, uh, to support such complex rules, well, if, if it cannot offload it to hardware, it is going to fall back automatically to doing that in software. Uh, you can also enforce uh, the fact that you want to do that in hardware and if you cannot, well, don't do anything at all. But yeah, TC is in general much more powerful than, than the if 2 rules. Uh, a, a few words about um, RSS contexts. So, uh, it can happen that you might want to steer your traffic to multiple queues at once or multiple CPUs at once. So you might want to say, um, I want all of my traffic to be spread across uh, N CPUs, uh, but um, let's say you want to say, I want all of my TCP traffic to be handled by CPU 0 and 1, and all of my UDP traffic to be handled by uh, CPU 2 and 3. So instead of steering your traffic to one receive queue, you can steer your traffic to an RSS in direction table and have the, the, the whole RSS spreading occurring for that particular flow. So this is achieved through the use of what we call RSS context. Uh, so you can create a new context with this tool and then start steering traffic to uh, this new context. So this can also be useful um, let's say for traffic prioritization. Uh, you can make sure that in, uh, in the forwarding mode, uh, you spread the forwarding for the high priority traffic to, um, to N CPUs, and the low priority traffic is only going to be forwarded by one CPU. So that way you can make sure that you, are going, uh, you have more chances to, to correctly forward the high priority traffic. Um, so, uh, all of the techniques that we saw as of right now uh, are specific to the, the receive mode. Uh, but we do have the, the equivalent processes in transmit. So when you transmit packets, it, it's much more simple uh, because you are already running from the CPU mode and so you have full control uh, on your hardware at that time. It's not your hardware that is going to decide the CPU that processes your packet. You are already processing the packet. So what you need to do uh, is select on which transmit queue you want uh, to send your packet. Um, usually what you do is you select uh, the transmit queue according to, 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 to the CPU. So uh, this is done using the, the technical XPS, standing for transmit packet steering. Um, so what we do usually is that we uh, assign one transmit queue per CPU and depending on the CPU that is going to be used to send the packet in a socket, um, we are going to use the transmit queue associated to the CPU core. Uh, but you can also assign transmit queues to receive queues. Um, this is to make sure that uh, the, if you are in a multi-threaded environment, uh, it's always the same CPU that is going to be used for uh, receive and transmit of any, any flow. Uh, but it's much more for optimization of your, of your cache. But the most common thing to do is to stick with assigning one transmit queue per CPU. So this is how it is used. Uh, it's also based on CSFS uh, configuration. And it's basically um, saying, I want to associate this CPU to this transmit queue or this RX queue to this transmit queue. Um, Modern NICs also provide other types of offloading. So we are not going to talk about spreading and steering anymore, but we are also going to talk about some features that some NICs provide uh, that can help you gain a bit more performances. So um, one uh, very uh, uh, time-consuming process can be the checksumming. So computing the checksums um, inside the headers of your, of your packets. So when you are transmitting a packet, uh, an IPv4 or IPv6 packet, you have to fill in all of the fields of this packet and one of these fields is a checksum. Uh, so computing the checksum, it takes some CPU time and it's also very easy to do. Uh, so some, some NICs can compute the checksum for you on the fly. So basically you, you are going to tell them, send this packet 
and while they are sending it, they are also going to compute the checksum and put the checksum at the correct place in your header. So in that case, the kernel is going to leave the checksum field empty with zeros. And so this is why when you are offloading the checksumming, uh, all of the packets that are going to go out of your system are going to be reported with a wrong checksum by TCP dump or Wireshark. It's because the kernel will not have computed any checksum and the checksum computation occurs uh, after the, the TCP dump uh, hook. Uh, it is going to be done actually inside the hardware. So you won't ever see on your system the packet with the checksum being filled. Uh, other things that can be offloaded is filtering. So uh, I've talked about filtering a bit earlier. So dropping some flows uh, in the NIC. So this is on the receive path. Uh, what you can also do is uh, filter based on the MAC address or the VLAN. So the, the MAC filtering, if your if your uh, NIC implements it, it's it will be done automatically. Uh, it's basically that the, the NIC is going to to keep track of all of the multicast domains uh, your your NIC belongs to, and also a list of MAC addresses that should be whitelisted for your device. And when a frame is going to, to come in with a wrong MAC address, the NIC is going to drop it uh, we, without even notifying the CPU that an incoming frame ha has arrived. Um, and same goes for VLANs. So uh, you can uh, enable what we call the VLAN filtering. And in that case, uh, all of the VLANs that, that belong uh, to your interface uh, are going to be whitelisted and, and packets that are coming in that, uh, that reside in the wrong VLAN are going to be automatically dropped by your NIC. Uh, also, some other kinds of offloading are uh, data insertion. Uh, so a, a good example of that is uh, having the NIC automatically insert the VLAN tag in your frames. So it, it's pretty similar to the checksumming, uh, but in that case, the NIC is going to also put in the, the information about the VLANs. And it can also do the same uh, in the receive side. So strip the VLAN tag as the packet is coming in. So remove it from the packet and notify the CPU of the VLAN information inside the descriptor. Um, also, you can have Nix doing some packet segmentation. So it's when you want to send a very large packet uh, that needs to be cut into several pieces. Uh, so with TCP or big TCP packets or UDP packets, uh, you call that segmentation or fragmentation. And there's a typo here. Um, and the NIC is going to automatically cut the packet into several pieces and fill in the header with the correct values. Uh, when you have, for example, uh, fields that you need to increment for each frame, uh, the NIC will do that for you. Uh, and finally, uh, a, a technique that is pretty recent uh, and it's purely a software technique, it's XDP. So XDP stands for uh, Express Data Pass. The principle of XDP is that you are going to execute a BPF program directly from within the NIC driver. So BPF is the, the Berkeley packet filter. It's a, a small program that is that you are going to compile. Uh, it has its own programming language and, um, and its own bytecode. Uh, it's designed basically to write filtering rules and so you are going to make so that your NIC driver is going to execute this program for each incoming frame. Uh, but since it is directly executed by your driver, it's executed basically as early as possible. So uh, just as the packet arrives, the, B the BPF program is going to run for each frame and decide if you want to pass this frame. So basically you allow this frame to be processed by your CPU. If you want to drop this frame, so it's not interesting, I want to drop it, or re redirect the frame to another interface. So basically do some forwarding. And the decision is going to be uh, taken very, very early on. And you can insert the program from user space. So it, it allows you to write some very uh, application specific code and run that uh, as early as possible uh, when you process your packets. So you don't have to, tr to traverse all of the kernel stack to decide if you want to do something interesting or not with the packet. Uh, XDP is also used um, for uh, another interesting thing, which is uh, AFXDP. So AFXDP is the response from the networking community uh, within the Linux kernel to uh, DPDK. So the, the goal here is to, uh, 
to do the packet processing basically in user space. So uh, instead of once again traversing all of the kernel stack uh, before processing the packet, DPDK, uh, the, the goal was to basically write a small driver in user space and have all of the data coming directly in user space and being processed here. So it allows you once again to write very specific code uh, to process the data. Um, AFXDP uses XDP to take a very early decision on whether you want this packet to be processed by user space or processed by the Linux kernel. And so with that, we have the, the best of both worlds. We still have the very powerful uh, Linux kernel stack that you can use for some traffic. And for other traffic, you can directly forward the packet through a special socket uh, with the type AFXDP and then uh, your, your kernel stack is not entirely bypassed. And it's a, a fully upstream solution contrary to DPDK, which is a third party program. So uh, with all of that information in mind, uh, here are some, some good resources and documentation, uh, but there are lots uh, of the best information you can find will be in the, the Linux source code, in my opinion. Uh, so, thank you for, for listening, uh, that was a lot of information in, in a short amount of time, so I, I hope you enjoyed. And uh, yeah, sorry about the few typos, and, and thank you very much, have a, have a nice day, and we'll see right now for the questions. Bye.